So we're continuing our verse-by-verse study through uh, the Gospel of John, and this morning we're going to look at John chapter 14, verses 17 through 20, and the title of the sermon is The Indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Indwelling of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14, starting in verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and in I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you again for the privilege of being here together to study your word and to learn what we can learn as we look at this topic of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, how we need your help today. Enlighten us. Shine your light on us. Allow us to see your word, God, and to live a life that would be spirit-filled. And so as we study this this morning, I pray for your richest blessings through Christ on our church body today, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. J.D. Greer, author of Why the Spirit Inside You is Better Than Jesus Beside You, writes this, quote, I have always thought that Jesus gave a very odd step to completing the Great Commission, basically telling the disciples, do nothing until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. With millions of people waiting to hear the gospel, he instructed the only ones who knew anything about it to sit and wait until he had sent them something mysterious from above. That meant that they were not to write any books. That meant they were not to go out and try to make converts. That meant that they were not to plan. They were to do nothing. Why? Until the Holy Spirit came... They really couldn't do anything of value to the mission. Jesus had promised that he would build his church and the mission. He could accomplish more in one moment through his spirit than they could accomplish in 10,000 lifetimes of their own, close quote. It's kind of an amazing thought, isn't it? That right after the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, he then says, as he ascends into heaven, go and wait in the upper room until the promise of the Holy Spirit comes to be with you. Charles Spurgeon reminds us with a similar quote, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire, we are useless. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at John chapter 14, verses 15 and 16 in a sermon that I entitled, Another Helper. And in that sermon, we saw how in these verses that God has given us a great responsibility. We are to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. And we're to prove our love for him by keeping his commandments. I mean, look at verse 15. Jesus did say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so if we love Christ, of course, we know Jesus is God. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the door of the sheep. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the good shepherd. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the true vine. And so if you believe that this morning, then Jesus, when he says, if you love me, all that he is, then this means that we will obey him and that we will keep his commandments. Now, that can be difficult. In fact, that can be really challenging. And so we clarified last time we were together that we are not held to the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, which gives a lot of dietary law, a lot of dress code, a lot of civil law, a lot of ceremonial manners. We're not held to those things in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, but rather we are New Covenant Christians in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus gives us over 50 commands that he expects us to obey. obey. 
And so he gives us all kinds of things like love one another and serve one another and forgive one another. And just think about the Sermon on the Mount, radical, righteous behavior that God calls us to. And he calls us to love Christ with all of our heart. And if you do love him with all of your heart, then you will obey him. And if you say that you love him, but you don't obey him, then you are a hypocrite. If you say that you love him, but you don't keep his commandments, then you are a phony. If you say that you love him, but you will not obey him, then you are a fake, a sham, and a pretender. You say, well, Adam, it's really hard to obey all that Christ said, to which I would say, I agree. In fact, it's impossible to obey all that Christ said, at least in your own strength. And that's exactly why you've been given another helper. And so as a Christian, we have a great responsibility to love God and obey him. And we have a great helper, the Holy Spirit, who comes and who helps us to do exactly what it is that God's called us to do. Remember, the word helper is the word parakletos. Sometimes we refer to the Holy Spirit as our paraclete. And the word parakletos comes from two Greek words, para, which means near or beside, and the word kaleo, which means to call or to invite. And so if you put those two words together, we talked about how one is called alongside to help. The connotation of that is that you have one that you're inviting to be near you to help you do what it is that God's called you to do. You have the Holy Spirit. He is our comforter. He is our counselor. He is an exhorter. He's an intercessor. He's an encourager. And he's an advocate. And he is our help, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fulfills all the roles of those things I just described in our lives. And one of the most important things for us to realize with this word parakletos is that it doesn't only describe the Holy Spirit as a comforter in the sense of a warm blanket that comes around you and you do nothing. Now listen carefully to me. There are times in our life we need to be comforted. Okay, so I'm not saying don't see the Holy Spirit as a comforter. He will come be with you. When you shed a tear, he is beside you, he is near to you, and he will comfort you. But the word means that he comes alongside of us to help us do what it is that God's called us to do. And so if you only see him as a comforter and you do nothing, you're missing a little bit of the whole point of what the word means, which is one who comes alongside you to help you accomplish. And what he calls us to accomplish in this context is to keep Christ's commands. And you can't do it on your own. You need a helper. And when you're weak, he strengthens you. And when you're lazy, he exhorts you. And when you need prayer, he intercedes for you. And when you need direction, he counsels you. And please note that Jesus prays in verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Last time we talked about if the Father is sending another helper, that means that he has already sent us a first helper. And we discovered last time that that first helper would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read that in 1 John 2, 1, as we see that word parakletos referring to Jesus. You know this passage, 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, it's the word parakletos, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so what we're learning is the word parakletos doesn't only refer to a helper in the Holy Spirit, but it's another helper. Your first helper is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your righteousness. He also intercedes for you, John 17. He saves you. And then it just kept getting better because then we discovered not only do we have the Holy Spirit as a helper, Jesus Christ is our helper, but God the Father is our helper. According to Psalm 54, verse 4, we are told, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. So praise God that he's our helper. Praise God that Jesus is our advocate. Praise God that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. We have three helpers in our triune God. How could we ever complain? How could we ever fall short? How could we ever be discouraged? God will empower you. He will enable you. He will lift up your countenance. God will be exalted in your life. And so you have a great responsibility to love God and to obey his commandments, but you have a great helper in the Holy Spirit, 
and in our triune God. Today, I want to talk to you about how not only do we have a great responsibility, we have a great helper, but you have a great promise. You have an incredible promise, and really, this promise is a threefold promise, and we'll only look at the first aspect of it this morning, but over the next couple of weeks, maybe, we're going to look at how this promise is this, the Holy Spirit abides in you. The Holy Spirit abides in you, and we're going to look at this threefold promise of that this morning. Next week, we'll look at how Jesus will never abandon you, and then through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you will be united with Christ. This morning, I was going to preach all three, and something in my ear, maybe it was the Holy Spirit, said, don't do it. Just do number one. Just give them the first one, which is all about being indwelt in the Holy Spirit. And so this is what we're looking at this morning. First, today, this is the first major heading of three. We'll just look at the first one. The Holy Spirit abides in you. And so that first blank, if you are taking notes, is this. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. You read it right there in verse 17, even the spirit of truth. Let's just pause right there and let's take a little time to unpack what this means. The spirit of truth is a direct reference to the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth is because that is one of the Holy Spirit's roles is to reveal spiritual truth to believers. Outside of the Holy Spirit, you cannot see or understand the truth. You may read the Bible, but you will not be able to comprehend the Bible and what it's saying, or you might even misinterpret it. Take Jeremiah 29, 11, for example, popular verse that we love so much. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. And not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Well, sometimes in the larger evangelical world, when people read this verse, they walk away. If they're not careful, they could walk away with a prosperity gospel. You've heard of the prosperity gospel is God wants you. That means you, every believer, to be rich. And God wants you to have a lot of money. And God wants you to live in luxury. And they'll argue things such as like, well, Abraham was rich, and, and Job was rich, and David was rich, and therefore this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, says that God has plans to prosper you. And so every Christian should be rich. It's called the prosperity gospel. Well, I would say that I believe that's a misinterpretation of this verse. And when you look at this verse in its context, then you have to understand that word prosper, you know, it's a Hebrew word. It's actually the Hebrew word that you all know, the only Hebrew word you know, which is shalom. It's shalom, which means peace. The idea behind that God will prosper you has nothing to do with physical monetary gain, but it has everything to do with the fact that you can still have peace with God. In fact, Jeremiah is preaching and preparing for what God's going to do in judging Israel, send them to exile, bring them back from exile. And in that message, Jeremiah gives us 29, 11, he's basically saying to them, God is still going to be your peace. Even though he's going to judge you, there's always a remnant, and God will be your peace. And even though Israel will be exiled, God's presence will still be with you. God will bring you back to the land, and God will send them a savior, and God will look after his own. And even the depraved sinner needs to know that today, the prosperity God provides for you is peace with God, Romans 5. And so all I'm saying is this, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you could really not understand the Bible at all. Or you could take things completely out of context because it may be that you're not filled with the Spirit or able to interpret properly what it is that God's saying. And again, this verse is not promising, Jeremiah 29, 11, every believer, mansions, and Mercedes. Though if you have those, you can be my friend, all right? That's not, that's not what he's promising. He's promising something that money can't buy. He's promising the intangible of being delivered from your son, being in the presence of God, and prospering in your spiritual walk with the Lord. And here's here's, here's what I'm saying. You may read your Bible, but you cannot properly understand the Bible without the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit who lives in every true believer to help you understand God's word, and the Holy Spirit then applies it to our life. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. In the next chapter, just look at it with me, if you will. Chapter 15, verse 26, he calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth again when he says, but the helper 
comes, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Well, there's another reference to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. And the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, is to tell the truth about Jesus. Jesus tells his disciples the truth about the Holy Spirit now, and then the Holy Spirit will tell the disciples of the truth of Jesus later. The Holy Spirit does not have a different agenda. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a different way that he works. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak in a different language. The Spirit of truth speaks for God because he is God. In fact, look over at the very next chapter, John 16. You see one more reference to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. John 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you all into the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. In other words, Jesus is promising that after the resurrection, he is sending his helper to come from the Father, and he will be the spirit of truth. And Jesus is saying, I am telling you about him now, and he will tell you about me later. There is no division between Jesus, who is the truth, and the Holy Spirit, who is called the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit will come to initiate and complete the building of the body of Christ, which is his church. He does this by regenerating us and then empowering us to use spiritual gifts in order to edify the church. The broad scope of the Holy Spirit's divine activity includes convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ and transforms believers into the image of Christ. I believe that the Holy Spirit is supernatural and the sovereign agent in regeneration, baptizing believers into the body of Christ, and even in creation. The Holy Spirit also indwells, sanctifies, instructs, empowers believers for service, and seals us for the day of redemption. Just a reminder of what we're talking about. The Spirit of truth does all of this, and get this, new, new concept. We could accurately say that a big part of the Holy Spirit is to simply shine a floodlight on Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to shine a floodlight on Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not take our attention away from Jesus, but he brings our attention to Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not get in the way, but he points us to the way. The Holy Spirit is not here to steal the show, but to put the spotlight on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does not speak outside of Scripture. He speaks the Scripture to us. The Holy Spirit does not use an audible voice. He uses the Bible to give us understanding and direction. I've had a lot of people tell me over the years in different environments that I've been in that the Holy Spirit has spoken to them and has told them to, to do things that are in direct conflict with Scripture. I've had people tell me that it's okay for them to get a divorce, even though they have no biblical grounds whatsoever. I've had people tell me that it's okay for them to curse, to fornicate, to do drugs, because God wants them to be happy, and he understands what their needs are, to which I always say to those type of people, but God also wants you to be holy, and the only way that you can really be holy is to obey God. Your happiness, true happiness, is not found in sin. If it is found in sin, then that's just the happiness of the flesh. But what we're looking for is a happiness of the Spirit. And the happiness of the Spirit always obeys God's Word, and the Holy Spirit shines His light on Christ and His teaching and the living Word, the Bible, so that we could come under its authority and to live out the principles and precepts of Scripture. Now, there's another group of people who would tell me that God told me to do this or that. And they're not speaking about an audible voice, but rather a prompting of the Holy Spirit. What you got to say about that, Tyson? What about, what about the Holy Spirit? Does he prompt us to do things or not on a daily basis? Well, I would say this about that thought. They, they would say that something like, you know, well, the Holy Spirit told me to witness to this person 
or to give a charitable donation to this certain need, or to pick up the phone and call somebody or write them an encouraging note. And so I think the Holy Spirit told me to do that. What do you think, Adam? Well, the way I like to think of it is I would just say to all of that, praise God. Like, praise God that you have a sensitive heart that you want to love God and love other people and serve them in exactly the way the Bible teaches you that you should be doing. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we are to be a witness for Christ, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The Bible teaches us that we are to be cheerful givers, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. The Bible teaches us that we are to bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. And so I would say that God does guide us through his word, and the Holy Spirit points us back to those verses and those principles in Scripture at that moment, and the Holy Spirit enables us, and he empowers us, and he urges us to follow in complete obedience on a daily, hourly, and minute-by-minute basis. And so there is the Holy Spirit at work. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's shining a light on Christ. He's shining a light on the Word of God. And He's grabbing you, and He's pulling you over, and He's pointing you to Scripture. And so, therefore, if the application for you at that moment is, I'm going to witness to this person, I'm going to give a special gift, I'm going to do something out of the ordinary, then by all means do it. Why wouldn't you want to do it? It's in Scripture already. So I think that we could get a little bit more radical saying, you know what, that's the Holy Spirit pointing me to his word, and his word says I need to be doing this on a regular basis as part of my character. I'm a witnesser. I'm a giver. I'm an encourager. So why not do it right now? Maybe another way to think about it. Turn with me to John 14, 26. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, I believe this verse, when it says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things, I don't believe that's talking about things outside of Scripture. I don't think that it's talking about anything else other than the Bible itself. When it says, I will teach you all things, and Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking to his disciples, I think that he's saying, and he's referring to the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to give the apostles more divine revelation. The Gospels record the actions and the words of Christ, while the epistles record the actions and the words of the apostles. And the Holy Spirit gave the apostles divine revelation, which is recorded for us in Scripture. I'm talking about 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. I'm talking about 2 Peter 1.20 and 21, knowing first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so I'm saying, when the Holy Spirit teaches us all things to the apostles, he's like, hey, I'm going to teach you even more. The full revelation of God is not done yet. The canon of Scripture did not close with the Gospels. So there's extra things that God divinely revealed to the apostles after Jesus had already ascended into heaven. I believe the Holy Spirit gave us the Scripture, and then the Holy Spirit reminds us of Scripture. I don't think for one moment that the Spirit speaks outside of Scripture. If he did, then we would need another book, another Bible, or another inspired document. But the Bible clearly teaches us in the book of Revelation, you know this verse, don't add to or take away from this book, lest the plagues in this book be added to you. And so we never want to add any authoritative, divine revelation from the Holy Spirit other than what he's already given us, which is completely sufficient in the Bible, right? The Bible's all we need for life and godliness. The Bible is the only inspired book. The Bible is true. The Bible alone is trustworthy. The Bible alone is infallible. The Bible alone is inerrant. The Bible has stood the test of time. The Bible alone is the living words of God, which are sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible is like a fire shut up in my bones, Jeremiah said. The Bible is like a hammer that crushes a rock into pieces. The Bible is what the Holy Spirit gave us, and the Bible is what the Holy Spirit teaches us and brings to our remembrance. 
I can't for the life of me figure out why somebody wants to go to some incredible revelation outside of Scripture. It doesn't get any better than this. All that we need is right here. And so that's the major function of the Holy Spirit in today's economy, and, and at least is, is the way I understand what's being said. He's just reminding us. He's already given us it all. Now he's reminding us, hey, you, you need to be accountable to this. Hey, you, you need to think about getting off your seat and serving in this way, giving in this way, sharing Christ in this way. He's reminding us about what the Bible's already told us that we ought to be doing. Now, I remember the first time I experienced this reminder of the Holy Spirit in a pretty vivid way. I was on the uh, high school. Um, I was in high school. Uh, I was in high school. Let me just say that. I was in high school, and I was on the visitation team at our church, good old Southern Baptist Church in Georgia, where we go out knocking on doors, and we're following up with visitors that came to our church. And I'm kind of brand new to this whole witnessing thing, but I'm excited about it, man. It's like, this is going to be awesome. We're going to go tell them about Jesus. So we get into some house, and I start sharing the gospel with somebody, and this particular person was really big on a works-based salvation, which is simply means every time I talk to them about how do you think you get to heaven, they were like, oh, it's by being good. It's by doing good things. It's because I grew up in the church and because I've been baptized and all the stuff they're throwing out. And I'm trying to think, like, I just know that's not right. I know that's not right. And I know there's a verse of scripture. So I kept trying to tell them that it's not about all the things you do. And they were like, no, the Bible says, you know, he who helps himself helps himself. You know, you got to help God, you got to help yourself. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not what the Bible teaches. And he says, well, show me where the Bible says what you're saying. And I couldn't remember the passage. I'm like, oh, man, I know there's a verse in there somewhere about, you know, it's not, not about works, but it's by grace. And so I just remember pausing in my spirit in that moment and just saying, God, would you just remind me of where that is? I, like, really need that verse right now. <laughs> just like this. Boom. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I'm like, oh, let's turn to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You know, we open up. <laughs> For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Now you say, Adam, is the Holy Spirit about just popping up references in your brain all the time? It could be. I mean, he could do that. I, I had studied it before. I had tried to partly memorize it before. I think more importantly than just the reference is the concept and the principle of salvation is not about works, but it is about grace. That's the Holy Spirit constantly coming alongside of us, reminding us every moment of every day, don't do this, don't do that, do this, this is better, that's a lie, God's better when you glorify him this way. That's what he's doing constantly. Listen to me, the Holy Spirit is, excuse me, the Holy Spirit is not God's assistant. The Holy Spirit is almighty, like God himself. The Holy Spirit is not some side component of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is completely God. The Holy Spirit is not to be slighted or diminished, but rather he is to be exalted and worshiped as God. And you can pray directly to the Holy Spirit, and you can depend directly on the Holy Spirit, and you can talk about the Holy Spirit as if he is God, because he is. And too many times we're just afraid. We're just like the Father, the Son, and we're like, you know, the Father and the Son. And we need to be like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who points us to the Word of God. And I'm not talking about something weird. I'm talking about the Spirit of truth who brings us to the Word of truth that we depend on for our very lives. And so now that we see the Spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit, let's look at our second heading this morning. The Holy Spirit is unseen by the world. Notice how in our verse, this one verse we're looking at, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. The Holy Spirit is unseen by the world because the world lives in darkness. Just like the world fails to see Christ, the world fails to see the Holy Spirit. If the world doesn't know Christ, then the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit either. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit until it first receives Christ. If you don't have Christ, then you will never receive the Holy Spirit. Do you remember Simon, the sorcerer? From Acts 8, who saw the great, incredible things that the apostles were doing, miraculous power, and he came up to them in Acts 8, 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. 
But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? Obviously, Acts was a special time when miraculous things were happening in the church and the power of the Holy Spirit was so obvious that even unbelievers wanted to tap into that Holy Spirit power, but they didn't have the right heart. This is what Simon is experiencing in Acts chapter 8. He was so spiritually blind that he thought he could buy the Spirit's power and the Spirit's presence with money. The world simply cannot see or understand the Holy Spirit because the world has rejected Christ. But when a person repents of their sin and Christ saves them through the power of his resurrection, he then at that moment fills them with the Holy Spirit. And everyone who sees the light of Christ with their spiritual eyes will come to know the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not like you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ and some, you know, sometime later, many months or years later, get a second blessing of, for your first time experiencing the Holy Spirit. No, no. When Christ saves you, he fills you. The Bible reminds us about there's light and there's darkness. Christ is that light that shines in the darkness. He's the true light. So we've got to first come through Jesus. And when you come through Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. And when you reject Jesus... The Romans rejected Jesus, the Jews rejected Jesus, many of the Gentiles rejected Jesus, and so they were not seeing or understanding the Holy Spirit. But then God, through Christ and through the sovereign grace of our Lord, begins to pick one at a time and save one at a time until he's built a body of believers called the church, and he allows them to see and to experience the joy of salvation. And for those who are in Christ, they are no longer walking in that darkness, but they are walking in the light. And when you were in darkness, you couldn't see the light. But now that you are in the light, you are able to see Christ. And so simply, bottom line of what I'm trying to say here is unbelievers cannot understand the Holy Spirit at work because they do not know him. And the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him or knows him. Without a radio, radio waves go unnoticed. But once the radio is turned on, the music plays beautifully. The Holy Spirit goes unnoticed by the unsaved who have no spiritual life. They just simply cannot hear the words of our Lord. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, maybe turn there with me if you will. This is a common um, reference, cross-reference for this type of, of concept that we're talking about, how the world cannot receive the Spirit. They don't understand the Spirit. It's right here, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, this word discerned in that particular verse, it means, quote, to examine with a view to finding fault. It means to judge in a negative light. In other words, the natural man finds fault with God and the natural man judges God. The natural man who is an unbeliever cannot accept the things of God because it is foolishness to him. Because the natural man is not able to understand. They're spiritually discerned. It just is saying that they're making a bad judgment upon Christ because they don't know Christ, because they've not been saved, and they don't have the Spirit giving them true discernment, wise discernment. When you have Christ, you have a proper discernment. You have the ability to see the light. In Christ, you are an overcomer. In Christ, you do have understanding. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. He illuminates your mind. He enlightens your soul. He empowers your walk. He expands your ministry. He saturates your life with his presence because he lives in you, which is where I want to spend the rest of our time, our third heading this morning, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The rest of verse 17, while the world cannot receive because it neither sees or knows him, you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. We're talking now, plain and simple, about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit regenerated you, he enabled you to understand the things freely given to us by God. 
You know the Spirit because you know God. And guess what? The Spirit dwells in you. That means He abides in you. He remains in you. He lives in you. And He's not going anywhere. We're talking about the perseverance of the saints and the persistence of the Holy Spirit as taking up residence in your heart and in your life. Now that's new. And that's different for in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was at work in people's lives, but there is a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Thank God. That's why the New Covenant's new. And the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in part is this idea and this concept of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The New Testament believer who is in Christ has a new heart. Ezekiel prophesies about this. Turn there with me, if you will. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. This is what we're talking about. Ezekiel, remember, is prophesying to the Jews during their exile in Babylon. Ezekiel is a man of vision and of hope, and he uses parables and signs and symbols to bring about God's word to God's exiled people. And so here's what he says to them in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now he's talking about, this is a prophecy of the new covenant. So Ezekiel's in the Old Testament and he's reminding those who are in exile, we're about to bring you back home. And then we're about to bring you Jesus, and then you're going to have a new heart and a whole new way. This verse is talking about the doctrine of salvation. God will change you, and he will give you a new spirit, and he will give you a new heart, and he will remove your hard heart that didn't want God, and your hard heart that didn't want God's words, and your hard heart that didn't like God's rules, and you didn't want God's righteousness. And he's going to remove that hard heart, that heart of stone, and he's going to give you a heart of flesh, which means a soft heart a heart that's sensitive to the things of God, a heart that loves God, a heart that loves and is hungry for the word of God, a heart that wants to come under God's authority, a heart that wants to obey God's word, which is why we read in the very next verse, Ezekiel 36, verse 27, and so now you're saved, verse 26, you got a new heart, you're born again, praise God, and then what does he say? Verse 27, and I will put a new spirit, so the new covenant is Christ in you, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Remember what I said a couple of weeks ago? What Jesus is to our salvation, the Holy Spirit is to our sanctification. Jesus came to save us from our sins, and then he was going to leave and send another to sanctify us. It is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and who enables us to walk in his statutes. It's the Holy Spirit that reminds us to be careful to obey God's rules. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us and encourages us and cautions us and empowers us to live the victorious Christian life. And so this Old Testament passage is pointing to a New Testament reality. The Holy Spirit did not work in the same way or to the same degree as he did in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, after the cross, after the resurrection, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit showed up in a brand new way. And the way that's different here in the New Covenant, once Pentecost came, is we are now able to see the full effect of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Ezekiel says that when God gives you a new heart and puts his spirit within you, this will cause you to walk in his statutes and to help you obey his word. So more than just popping in here and there to direct you in your daily decisions, the Holy Spirit's job is to come alongside of you and to help you obey his rules. Before, there was a sort of coming and going of the Holy Spirit. And we see this when the Bible tells us about Moses' face glowing when he came down off the mountain and King Saul prophesying when the Spirit would come upon him. And we even read about how David prayed in Psalm 51, 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
The fact that David even prayed this way after he sinned shows us that there is a slight difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament work of the Holy Spirit. I think the best way to say it, and I'm just getting this from Dr. Larry Pettigrew, who writes a book on the Holy Spirit, who taught this class in seminary years ago, but I think the best way to say it is this. The Spirit dwelt with the Old Testament saints through the community, but would not be in them individually and intimately. Under the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was with believers in a general sense, but in the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit now dwells inside of you, and He does so personally and permanently. Your sin may grieve the Spirit, and it may quench the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will never depart from you. He forever lives inside of you. And that's why it says at the end of John 14, 16, that the Holy Spirit will be with you for how long? 14, 16, he will be with you forever. It says that he dwells in you and he will be with you, which means this, he doesn't leave you on a bad day. He doesn't abandon you during tough times. He doesn't chide you when you are down. Rather, he comes alongside of you and he helps you and he comforts you and he counsels you and he prays for you and he encourages you. Being indwelled by the Holy Spirit is very similar to being filled with the Spirit. Turn to Ephesians 5.18. You know the passage well. There's a connection between being indwelled and being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, the indwelling emphasizes the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Being filled with the Holy Spirit emphasizes giving Him full control of your life. Being indwelt is not a command. It is something that God sovereignly does at salvation. Being filled, on the other hand, is a command that you are to keep every single day. And this command to be filled with the Spirit is an imperative. That means it is not optional. That means that there is a partial responsibility placed on you to understand this and to do this. Being filled is a command. It's an imperative, but being filled is also, get this, it's also in the passive voice, which simply means that though God commands you to be filled with the Spirit, only God can do that to you. It's in the passive voice. You can't fill yourself. You, you can't fill yourself. It's something God has to do in you. He commands it, but only He can do it. There's a story about D.L. Moody speaking to a large audience in Chicago, and one day he held up a glass and asked, how can I get the air out of this glass? One man shouted, suck it out with a pump. Moody replied, that would create a vacuum and would shatter the glass. After numerous other suggestions, Moody smiled and picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass. There, he said, all the air is now removed. He then went on to explain that victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out a sin here and there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I would add to that, you can't make that happen. You can't take a picture of the Holy Spirit and douse it on yourself. Right? You can't fill yourself. It's passive. But you can get under the waterfall of God's word. And you can place yourself under the waterfall of God's grace. And you can place yourself in a position with arms open wide and repenting of all sin and asking the Spirit to fill you on a daily basis. And you can put yourself in that spot where God will do just that. So being filled is a command. Being filled is passive. Being filled is also in the present tense meaning that it is a daily thing. You can't just make it today off of yesterday's filling, just like you wouldn't want to drink yesterday's coffee or yesterday's pizza that's been sitting out on the counter all night, unless you're a teenager or a college student. Right? You wouldn't want to wear yesterday's clothes unless you're a teenager or a college student. You can't win today because of yesterday's victory. You better be ready to engage and fight today. You can't have a healthy marriage off of yesterday's love. 
right? You need to be loving and patient and considerate and kind unless you're a teenager or a college student. And that's why you're still single. That's kidding, all right? But if you're filled with the Spirit, then the rest of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, tells you what's going to happen. It's going to give you a God-honoring marriage where every part and parcel of your marriage points others to Christ. It's going to help you in your parenting and in obeying your parents. It's going to help you at work. It's going to help you uh, in spiritual warfare, putting on the armor of God. All of those are practical things that the Holy Spirit does in you and through you as he fills you. And so what we're saying is this, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit when it happens when you are saved and being filled with the Spirit is that everyday reminder that Christ wants to give you his word and fill you yet again on a daily basis. It's not about being weird or being mystical or being charismatic or being meditative all the time. What it does mean is that as a Christian, you are fighting against sin. You are recognizing and avoiding heresy. You are evangelizing with incredible zeal. You are praying with great passion. You are surrendering your life to the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called you to be holy. If you got anything from the sermon today, it's like the Holy Spirit indwells you so he can sanctify you, so he can make you holy. In fact, that's what 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. I remember reading that verse as a teenager growing up and I thought that verse is all about being buff. This is the temple, man. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. I got to take care of this. You know, you got to be careful how you work out and what you eat. Got to take care of the temple. Like, come on, that's not what it's talking about. In a sense, yes, you are an earthen vessel, but he's talking rather about the idea, not just a physical thing. And of course, we could talk about spiritual principles of physical health. You understand what I'm saying? But the idea here is that you are to be spiritually buff. All right, spiritually healthy, spiritually strong. When he says you're God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you, he's saying, so don't defile the temple. Don't enter into sin. Live a holy life. Let the Holy Spirit help you be holy and obey all that Christ has asked you to do because he dwells in you. And now you're able to commune with God on a daily basis. The story is told of a little boy who was flying a kite. It was a windy day, and the kite kept going higher and higher. Finally, it got so high that it was out of sight. A man passed by and saw the little boy holding on to the string. The man could not see the kite, and he asked the boy, how do you even know that a kite is up there? The boy replied, because I can feel it. Although we cannot see the Holy Spirit, We should be able to sense his work in our lives, changing us into the image of Christ. Can I be honest with you? That illustration is a little bit too ambiguous for me. It's not a complete mystery. Do we feel the Holy Spirit? I believe we do. But I also believe that we know him and we understand him and we see him. And we have a full view of who he is and what he does through the scripture. And the only way to know or understand the Spirit's work is to know and see Jesus. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I call you this day to repent of your sin. And I'm calling you this day out of darkness into his marvelous light. And on this very day, I'm telling you to to put yourself under the waterfall of God's grace so that you can experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian today, God's word commands that you be filled with the Spirit and that you are already indwelt as a believer, but you're to be filled, which means you are to surrender every day to the Lordship of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't run from him. Don't grieve him with your sin. Don't quench him with your stubbornness. Ask him to fill you. Ask him to have all of you. Ask him to enlighten you and to empower you and to enable you and to reveal himself to you through his word. Ask him to strengthen you, to help you, and to point you to God's truth found in the Bible. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study this morning the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What a topic. What a passage. What a scripture. 
What a God you are. We could never exhaust all the sermons in the world on the power and the indwelling and the filling and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God, I pray that in some small way that you've given us greater clarity of the Holy Spirit's role and how he shines a spotlight on the person of Jesus Christ and how the Holy Spirit reminds every believer every day of what your word tells us that we ought to be doing. And thank you that while we have that great responsibility to obey, that we have a great helper, the Holy Spirit, a great promise that you dwell in us and that you will enable us and empower us to do just that, not in our strength, Entirely, Lord, though we are called to put forth effort, but in your strength that we would walk this walk and that we would live in this way and that we would see you do great and mighty things through our daily dependence upon you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.